On the 8th of October in 2017, Jolian Palmer completed his final race in F1 before being dropped by Renault after an amicable split with four races still remaining. It was an embarrassing end to a career that never really got started and certainly placed Palmer as one of the most disappointing drivers in recent years. Since then, however, I actually think he's done a great job to repair his reputation as one of the best analysts and commentators in F1. So, how bad was Jolian Palmer really in Formula 1? Well, the first thing to say is that coming into F1, Jolian Palmer was a GP2 champion, which meant that expectations were always going to be high. Although, having said that, he did win the championship whilst in his fourth season, which is quite a long time to be in GP2 or F2 as it is now. Off the back of winning GP2 in 2014, much like Oscar Piastri in 2022, Palmer wasn't able to find a seat for 2015 and instead spent the year on the sidelines as the test and reserve driver for Lotus. For 2016, Romain Grosjean left the team to join the brand new Haas F1 team and this opened up a space for Palmer who signed up to make his F1 debut, originally as Pastel Maldonado's teammate. Now, try to imagine that as a combination. Despite scoring a podium at Spa, in 2015 Lotus were under massive financial pressure. The team almost fell off the grid before a late season deal was finalised in December for Renault to buy the team. And so, for 2016, it became a full-blown works Renault F1 team. Right on the eve of the car launch in early 2016, it was also announced that Pastel Maldonado was dropped by the team after his Venezuelan oil sponsors failed to make payments. Kevin Magnussen, who also spent 2015 on the sidelines, was subsequently announced as Palmer's teammate during the launch of the Renault RS16. Now, the Renault aspect of this is very important because coming into F1 as a GP2 champion with a struggling Lotus is very different than making your F1 debut for a works F1 team. Although 2016 was always going to be a transition year, this was now a desired seat because of the potential this team could have with the full financial backing of Renault in the future. This put even higher expectations and even more pressure on Palmer, and as you'll see in this video, expectations and pressure will be a bit of a theme. Now, on the face of it, Jolian Palmer's rookie season up against K-Mag wasn't a total disaster. In qualifying, their head-to-head -head was 11-9 to K-Mag, which is more than respectable, with their average gap being just half a tenth in favour of K-Mag. Their closeness in terms of pace was also reflected in their average qualifying position, which was 17.1 for K-Mag and 17.3 for Palmer. Now, at this point, you can probably tell that the Renault was by no means a good car. Due to Lotus's financial struggles in the previous year, the car just wasn't well developed going into the brand new season, and because of how late Renault took over the team, what you essentially had in 2016 was an underdeveloped Lotus that was just painted yellow. The start of the season was rough, to say the least, and it actually wasn't helped by the fact that his debut in Australia was actually pretty good. He finished P11 just outside of the points, but the way the British media hyped him up afterwards was just ridiculous. The Daily Mail said that Palmer's P11 debut made him the driver of the season opening race. And it's exactly these kinds of overhyped British media expectations for British drivers that did more harm than good for Palmer. Oh, and the actual driver of that race was undoubtedly Romain Grosjean, who scored points in Haas's first ever F1 race with a stunning P6 finish. Palmer wasn't deserving of that kind of hype and it put the spotlight on him at a point of the season where he really started to struggle most. In China, he got out-qualified by K-Mag by almost a full second, which really started to ring alarm bells. In Monaco, he had a nightmare weekend with incidents on all three days of running, which culminated in him crashing out of the race in wet conditions on the very first lap when the race was started. 
When Renault Jr. Sergei Sorokin stepped into the car during FP1 in Russia, he also finished the session ahead of Palmer. And whilst stuff like that would be absolutely meaningless against a driver who was driving well and had the confidence of the team, it's a bigger deal when it happens to a driver who is already struggling. Hungary was undoubtedly the biggest missed opportunity. A running in P10 and looking set to score his first points of the season, he spun off on lap 49, throwing away what would have been an absolutely huge result, which would have taken away a lot of pressure. By this point in the season, there were already rumours that Palmer could be replaced by GP3 driver and Renault Jr. Esteban Ocon. Ocon did eventually make his F1 debut at Spa mid-season with the Mana team. So, although replacing Palmer might seem like an overreaction, the mere fact that Renault were looking for a seat for him means that it wasn't entirely off the table. Despite the disappointment of Hungary, however, whilst that spin could have basically spiralled Palmer even further downwards, with his back up against the wall, from this point onwards he actually drove better than ever before and arguably the best he ever would. In the second half of 2016, he started to regularly outqualify K-Mag and even ended the season outqualifying him in four of the last five races. He had strong competitive races in Japan and Austin and finally scored his first career points in Malaysia with a P10 finish. Despite benefiting from quite a few midfield retirements, he put himself in the best position possible to benefit in front of drivers like Sainz, Kvyat and Massa, all in faster cars. Palmer would end the year 18th in the championship compared to 16th for Magnussen. Their race head-to-head -head was also very close, with K-Mag just edging out Palmer 11-9, with K-Mag scoring 7 points compared to Palmer's 1. This late-season form quite literally saved his F1 career. For 2017, Nico Hülkenberg was announced to join the team, and even though Renault also offered a one-year contract to retain K-Mag, he chose to sign a two-year contract with Haas. There was actually quite a lot of friction between K-Mag, Cyril Abitable, and the management at Renault. K-Mag actually was the one who originally chose to turn down Renault's offer in favour of Haas, but in an effort to get one over him, the team basically decided to announce first that they decided to drop him. K-Mag talked about this friction quite a bit in a book that he did years later, but he also talked about Palmer, saying, Jolian Palmer was a racing driver like an academic education. He studied and analysed everything. He knew the car inside out like an engineer, but he didn't have the confidence in his own capabilities, driving more with his brain than his heart. Jolian Palmer's rookie season as a whole, despite that late surge in form, was not good. In reality, the team would have had K-Mag and Hülkenberg as their 2017 lineup, but because losing K-Mag and dropping Palmer would have meant an all-new lineup for 2017, they thought that having a bit of continuity would have been valuable to them, especially because 2017 was a massive rule change with the wider cars and bigger tyres coming in. The combination of Palmer's upward trajectory and the departure of K-Mag, which would have left the team needing to find another new driver, I think all of that just put Palmer over the line, and so he was retained for 2017. The expectation for Palmer going into 2017 was that, even though Hülkenberg would be an even tougher benchmark, with him now in his second season and having that strong end to his rookie season, that he would carry that momentum into 2017. But that was not the case. Palmer didn't just get beaten by Hülkenberg, he got embarrassed. In the 16 races that they spent as teammates, Hülkenberg whitewashed Palmer in qualifying 16-0, with an average qualifying gap of over 7 tenths between the two drivers. What that meant in practical terms is that, whilst Hülkenberg's average starting grid position was 9.6, meaning he was always a regular in Q3 and always in the hunt for points, Palmer's average qualifying position was 15.1. One of the reasons why Palmer was so far off the pace was his horrible run of reliability issues. 
Now, this affected both drivers and even the Red Bull drivers, and at the time this caused a really tense relationship between Red Bull and Renault, but it just seemed to be affecting Palmer the most. He had multiple race-ending DNFs like in Australia, Azerbaijan and Monza, but what often gets forgotten and what actually cost him more than anything else was the massive amount of issues that he had during practice. In Australia, in practice one, he did just six laps. In Russia, he didn't even run in practice three because of an engine change. In Monaco, he had an engine failure after just six laps in practice one. In Azerbaijan, his engine caught fire in practice three, which meant that he couldn't even take part in qualifying. And then Silverstone was just a nightmare. MG UK issues in practice one, clutch problems in practice two, and then his car broke down on the formation lap to the grid due to a hydraulics leak. For Palmer, it just turned into a snowball effect. When the reliability issues started to shake his confidence early on, he just wasn't strong enough mentally to bounce back from them and deal with the pressure of his teammate dominating him in the other car. His confidence was absolutely shot, and even when he did have a clean weekend, he just wasn't able to grab the opportunity which could have at least given him some breathing room going into the second half of the season. During a four race stretch, he finished outside of the points in P11 three times. And what compounded his problem was that in the other car, Nico Hülkenberg was driving out of his skin. By mid season, Nico was a consistent point scorer and even finished as high up as sixth twice. Palmer wasn't just underperforming, he wasn't performing at all and the team was bleeding points. By the summer break, it was like 2016 all over again, with rumours of Palmer being replaced mid-season. Renault even ran Robert Kubica in a 2017 car during the Hungary tyre test to genuinely assess him, and this was a driver who had been out of Formula 1 since 2010 after having his rally accident, which almost cost him his life. Jolien himself knew that he needed a miraculous end to the season, akin to what he had towards the end of 2016, but in truth, he was gone by the summer break. In September, the team announced that Carlos Sainz on loan from Red Bull would replace Palmer in 2018. After the announcement, perhaps now with the pressure of knowing that he wouldn't be in Formula 1, he eventually did score his first and only points of the season with a P6 finish in Singapore. But even that wasn't enough to even keep him until the end of the season because when an opportunity arose to get Sainz in early to finish the season, a deal was negotiated between Renault and Palmer for Suzuka to be his final race. To rub salt in the wounds, Sainz on his Renault debut in Austin, having never driven the car, finished in the points with a P7 finish. In 16 races up against Nico Hülkenberg, Palmer scored just 8 points compared to Hülkenberg's 34. In the championship that would leave Hülkenberg in 10th, with Palmer just 17th. Whether you think it was harsh or not, Renault absolutely did the right thing in dropping Palmer. After Japan, the team sat 8th in the constructors, but just 4 races later at the end of the season, they managed to climb to 6th overall. Dropping Palmer when they did and getting Sainz out of a direct constructors rival put them two places up in the constructors and it was estimated at the time that the difference between finishing 8th and 6th for Renault gave them up to $10 million more. That was the end for Jolien Palmer in Formula 1 and I suppose the last word should go to him. In 2018, he became a pundit with Channel 4 and then later went on to work with Formula 1 as an analyst and commentator, which, as I said at the beginning, I think has done a lot to repair his reputation. Speaking on his time in Formula 1 and specifically his struggles in 2017, he said, I was having no fun whatsoever in what I was doing. My sense of driving, my desire was bitter. That was a shame because that's all I ever wanted to do. That is why I am not bitter that I'm outside because I am not interested. It's so easy to let things go. I am happy with what I am doing now. Life outside is just more fun for me.
Well, there you have it. If you did enjoy this video and want to support the channel, then don't forget to subscribe. That would be massively appreciated, and I'll see you in the next one.